the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. John of Krajdat preached these lines on this feast day over a hundred years ago in pre-revolutionary Russia. He said this, Let us be happy, beloved brothers and sisters, that we belong to the Orthodox, the Holy Orthodox Church, worthily and rightly glorifying the most holy sovereign Theotokos on this eminent day out of all the days of the year with special solemnity. There exist on earth many societies and entire governments that do not consider the need nor the obligation to call upon and glorify the Queen of Heaven and Earth, the Mother of our divine Lord Jesus Christ, and other saints and angels to submissively serve her lovingly as the true mother of God. Sadly, in Russia nowadays, we have heretics among us who actively <coughs> dishonor the mother of God, the saints, their icons, their relics, their festivals. Oh, if only they also unanimously with us glorified the worthy Queen of Heaven and Earth. Not much has changed, right? Like, but I love this, let us be happy. It's a great way to begin, you know? So today, the Holy Church glorifies the honorable dormition and translation of the Mother of God from earth to heaven. And what a joy that it falls on a Sunday morning, always on the 15th of August, rarely on a Sunday. You know, I don't know how it really works out, but it's shuffled around to, to be with us. So we've spent the last two weeks Fasting and the services, paraphrases. Not every night, but almost every night, eight or, eight or nine times the last couple of weeks. The choir has worked extra hard, thanks to the choir, uh, to get it right. And further, and most importantly, what a joy to celebrate the Mother of God. The fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments is to honor your father and mother. Jesus hanging on a cross, the time is now, like his earthly time is now like up, at least the way it is at, at that point, and he turns to his um, disciple, the apostle John, and he says to John, behold your mother, and to his mother, behold your son, like, you've got to take care of my mother, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore, you have to do that. And from that time, after Christ's resurrection and ascension, Mary uh, spends time in prayer. She's visited not only our patron, St. Ignatius, she visited our patron saint, uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, our protector, and, uh, but also Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead by Christ. And uh, she visited Athos, her garden. Uh, it's an incredible thing. And uh, the whole peninsula of uh, the Greece there, the Manathos, is dedicated to her. Um, she's kind of jealous of it. She was on Mount of Olives in prayer, where Christ ascended when the angel Gabriel came to her again. You know, he came to her and said, you're favored. You're favored by God. You're going to give birth to God the Word, you know? And she said, let it, let it be to me according to thy will. I accept this, you know? So he comes back to her and tells her that her time that she'll be passing were closed in three days. And um, she died. She fell asleep, we say. She died and was buried. And she didn't die from earthly illness, some kind of serious illness or anything. It was just that it was time. And the Lord took her soul in his hands, um, carried it up into heaven accompanied with the singing of angels, and there um, she's buried, and Thomas, who arrived late to the, when Christ appeared to the other disciples and said, you know, like, that he's resurrected, and uh, they saw him, uh, Thomas wasn't there. So the Lord has to show up eight days later again when they're gathered together and say, Thomas, you don't believe, you know, you're only going to believe if you put your fingers in my the print of the nails and all of that, and, and, and he was believing. Well, Thomas also shows up late 
for the, the burial of Mary. He shows up late for the dormition, the falling asleep. Everybody else is there. And Thomas is not there. And we sang today, it's by God's providence, like so that we would learn something. And what we learned was he said, I, I want to venerate her body. She'd already been in the grave three days. I don't care. Open it up. I want to, I want to, you know, embrace her. That's the way it, it reads. I said venerate. Really, he wanted to hug her. He wanted to embrace her. They open the tomb and she's not there. It's just the winding clock, like what we wrapped her in. You know, that's all that's there. The most amazing thing of this, this account is like what, what is going on now, you know, with death. So today we're celebrating her dormition, her falling asleep. We don't have like a special day for translation, meaning this other thing where her body has now been taken as well. Her soul's been taken and her body now is taken. This radical change of death has happened and we see it when Thomas shows up. But we just remember this day and it's kind of interesting because if you were gonna like make this a one-to-one -one with the death of Christ, we don't celebrate like the Pascha service and this has been called the Pascha, the summer Pascha. And we've done a good job with flowers. Thank you to those who did these. Um, absolutely beautiful. Um, and it's joyful. This is like Great Holy Friday, right? The falling asleep. The death of Christ is Great Holy Friday. And we don't observe it with like the same like bright, there's brightness in the sorrow, but we have the sorrow of it, right? We do the lamentations, the, the putting on the cross on the Thursday night, the taking down from the cross of Vespers, and the lamentations. And there's some sense that things are changing, but the lights are down, and, and we're sober about this. People stay up all night reading the Psalms all night. You know, we don't really have the resurrection yet. This is the, this day is not the remembrance of, like, Mary's resurrection. It's the remembrance of her death, her falling asleep, the dormition, the falling asleep. But this is the way it's celebrated now after the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, we may still have, when our loved ones die, we still are, we have grief. And there is no sense to pretend we don't, because death is not supposed to be part of the program. And with the loss, we feel the loss. And that is right. So we don't do, like, like some, like, do celebrations of life at the funeral. We don't do that. We still mourn the loss. But mixed in with that mourning is a possible, like, reality. That death has been broken, that death, Christ has trampled down death by death, you know? And for all of us that have been baptized into Christ, who've put on Christ, that baptism is death for us. We've joined ourselves with the death of Christ in that holy, those waters, those holy waters. And then what we say is, if you die in baptism, if you die before you die, then when you die, you won't die. So Mary and this like incredible woman, and then her incredible life, and then her most amazing dormition, and Thomas like kind of like pulling back kind of the, the curtain a little bit. Like, that's what death looks like now. It's like, well, where is she exactly? You know, the Lord has her. The Lord has her. What's happened with her is the reality for us, you know? So we were clear. I mean, we recognize that the earthly life that she has died, but we don't refer to it the same way the world does. We really try to live in that, that new resurrectional reality of the falling asleep, you know? The repose, like the resting. That's the way we view it. Because in Christ, Death doesn't have the final word. And whereas Christ has filled everything with himself, including death, that's not just like a theological, like theoretical, kind of out like a big dusty book from seminary kind of reality. That means he's filled your death with himself. You know, our deaths are filled with Christ. It's not just kind of a theological understanding. It's personal. It's personal. We have to give ourselves to Christ more and more. 
And we know that the time we have on earth is not just, you know, for ourselves, you know, it's a time of preparation and repentance, preparation for judgment. You know, we don't go to judgment going uh, with any kind of like arrogance. We go having prepared ourselves. That's what makes the fasting times before the sea so that rhythm, that's the rhythm we want. So in, in a way, you could say our time on earth is a fasting time. Our time on earth is a fasting time. Where we've spent two weeks getting ready for the feast. It's like a small Lent and a summer costume. No one wants to hear about fasting. <laughs> so I was saying, just as we've been preparing for the feast of the Dormition today, it, it came with time of fasting. That rhythm, fasting and then feasting, that's the rhythm like we have on earth and into heaven. Like This is a time of fasting and feasting, but it's mostly to be seen as a time of preparation. You know, we say like, you know, if you somehow escape death, you know, you have some kind of car wreck that you shouldn't have pulled through, someone will say, well, you must still have things to do on earth, or God must still need you here. But those are true statements. That's absolutely true. Like, sometimes we say stuff that isn't true, you know, like, well, that person's an angel now. Not true. You know, we say things that aren't right. But this is right. You know, if, if you come close to death, some kind of illness or, you know, some kind of event, an accident or something, and you pull through or escape it somehow, and someone says, you must have something to do here on earth, that's repentance. That's preparation. You know, that's reviewing of the soul, the heart, and confessing our sins. We prepare for the meeting with the heavenly king. And all this time, really, and Mary is the, the great example for us of a time of preparation, a change in our thoughts, of prayer, you know, of being fully devoted to her son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. So Mary's dormition is not sober. It's filled with Christ. It's filled with Christ. And this is, this is a joy to us. You know, we, in the catechumen class, Last week, I'm like, that's not good news. That's not good news that we're comparing orthodoxy to other teachings outside of orthodoxy. I'm like, they say that, and that's not good news. And this, this is the good news. Mary ushers in the good news. You know, we, I always say it, but and if we have a larger iconostasis, and we will one day, the Lord have mercy on us. I love what we have, of course. But um, above these panels on the iconostasis, we have the life of Christ going through. And we only have four up because we have kind of a narrow, we have more in the other place, which was less beautiful and more like an office building, but also wider. Um, anyway, the first one is on the angel Gabriel coming to the Theotokos. The life of Christ begins with, on earth, begins with Mary's yes. You know, so in a way, this, like, this is not only like the life of Christ and not only like the life of the Theotokos, thereby, it's really our life. This is our life. We have to say yes to Christ. We have to say yes to the Lord. And then the Lord grows in us and takes over and guides us. Our life is radically different. She is for us an example of what it means for the human soul to become more spacious than the heavens. When we exist in God, and put up a fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil, Mary becomes like the, the possibility of a human person. She's a human person. She's not a divine person. She's a human person. And we see in her life like the reality of the fullness of Christ. You know, and in a way, our church is it's absolutely dedicated to our protector, St. Ignatius, but with this incredible icon of the Theotokos above us, you know, she's, she's with us. She's looking down on us. She becomes for us a intercessor with Christ. Taking that first miracle at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. When they ran out of wine, they go to the Theotokos. 
She takes care of it. How does she take care of it? She goes to her son, and he's like, it's not time yet. And she turns to the, I say this probably every week in a sermon, and certainly every week in the catechumen class. But <coughs> she turns to the, the workers and says, do whatever he says. They, I'm taking care of it. He's going to take care of it. When I've spoken to Protestant groups, usually like, you know, those in their 20s and 30s that are working in youth ministry or something, and, and uh, you know, I show up and they're like, who's the guy in the dress? You know, they have nice things to say. Um, they're being funny, but it's not that funny. But anyway, so uh, it's okay. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll often, almost always speak about Mary. Because the scripture says that all, she says in the scripture, all generations will call me blessed. And I know you're the generation that, that does it. And sort of pick on them a little bit. But thanks be to God, as, as St. John Kronstadt said, like what a joy. Let's be happy that we do. That we do honor her. Honor her. What a joy it is to participate in the Feast of the Dormition. So let us adorn ourselves with every virtue. Her translation of the heavens, we want that to be our translation of the heavens. You know, her righteous living, we want that to be our righteous living. You know, a life of prayer, a life of focus on her son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So that we might prepare for the kingdom and we might proclaim to those on this side of death, at this side of the falling asleep, to prepare their souls. We need to prepare our souls and let people know to prepare their souls. Continual repentance and about the incorruptible adornment of Christian virtue. May Christ our true God grant that our deaths be unashamed, that our deaths be peaceful. We pray it in the liturgy, we pray it all the time. And that at the dread judgment seat of Christ, the whole, most holy Theotokos will please for us and will be our good answer to whatever we're asked. In the name of the Father and of the Son.